He who is born of God should grow to resemble his father. So if you are born of God, you must resemble your father. A stranger is one away from home, but a pilgrim is one who is on his way home. Let's go back home and be with the Lord and do what he has called us to do. Be sincere and honest, faithful in all that you do for the glory of God. The Christian's life is the world's Bible. Our life is the Bible that the world reads. Therefore, a Christian is free, but you are not free to commit sin. Our topic this morning is the miserable attitudes. <laughs> the miserable attitudes. Many Christians have miserable attitudes. Many so-called believers have miserable attitudes. The call of God upon our lives is not called to be miserable. It's not a call to be unhappy. It's not a call to be gloomy. It's not a call to be condemning others, but a call that we bring glory to the name of the Lord for the extension of his kingdom. A call whereby we begin to re-examine our lives and ask ourselves a question, are we still Christians? A call whereby anyone who sees us, we smell the fragrance of Jesus. We know that we are called unto holiness. We are called to answer the call and do what God has called us to do, not a call to to continue to show people our mean attitude. Whenever there are happenings, people begin to be miserable. They begin to show God mean attitude. Because mankind wants every time blessing, blessing. We have become blessing-oriented people that we cannot stand against the forces of darkness and declare war in the heavenlies, pulling down stronghold, rooting out the paths of evil, planting and reaping in righteousness. Are you a mean Christian? Are you a miserable Christian? I pray that this message will sink into our hearts, that we will begin to say, Lord, I choose to turn around I do not want to be a mean Christian. I do not want to be a miserable Christian. I do not want to have a miserable attitude. Regardless of who you are, regardless of the position you have, regardless of the social status, regardless of what you think you are, regardless of either you are in 5-4 ministry or 9-4 ministry, it does not matter. What you have to know is it is time for us to live life that is pleasing unto God in your words, in your actions, in your deeds, in your relationship that Jesus must be glorified. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Isaiah, chapter 47. I'm reading from verse 12 through 14. Isaiah 47, verse 12 through 14. Stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries, in which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by nor a fire to sit before. Here, the Bible tells about the wickedness that entered into the heart of God's people when they have decided not to follow the Lord the way he called them to follow, them, follow him. They begin to do things as they went. When the power of God in judgment come, most of these people begin to go to enchantments they begin to go to astrologers. They begin to go to bombers. They begin to go to witch doctors to help them to know why this misfortune had come upon them. Are you one of them? Many times people are tempted to forget about God, but to go and meet the palm readers, the promised. 
to read their hands, read their faces, to tell them why situation it is, how it is, for them to, you know, to gaze at the stars, to tell them all their stars. They try to go to the witch doctors for them to tell them, oh, your month is like this, the moon is that side and the sun is the other side. Because they want shortcuts. And God said, bring them. Let me see if they can save you from the power that has been demonstrated. It has been the norm of many people, even some Christians, to turn to sorcerers, astrologers, stargazers for solution and answer to misfortune. Maybe you're one of them, pretending. Many people say, well, I follow the Christian God, I follow the other God, in case each of them, who knows who will save. Miserable people will always run to the witch doctors, necromancers, and fortune tellers to give them answers to their problems. And here God is asking, bring them, let's see if they will never be stubble. They will totally be wiped out because they can't stand before God. But my Bible declared in the book of Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 that the righteous will always run to the name of the Lord because the name of the Lord is like a tower. It's a tower. The righteous run into it and he or she is saved. Regardless of what you may go through in life, you must always remember Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 that the name of the Lord is a high tower. You will run into it and you will be saved. Saints of God, we are warned about, about arm of flesh. Arm of flesh. In the book of Isaiah chapter 31 a moment, Isaiah 31 verse 1 through 3. Woe to those who go down to Egypt to help, for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord? God said, woe unto them. You who want to go to all this so-called flesh, arm of flesh for help. Woe unto you because you think they are strong, because you think they can help you. Woe unto you because you do not trust in the God of Israel, God who created heaven and earth, the ancient of days, the El Shaddai, El Gibo, El Bethel. You do not trust in him, but you trust in man because we want shortcut to get what we want. You know, when man is desperate, they begin to use all kind of means to meet their needs. They forget to know that devil will only give you a temporary relief. But surely he will destroy you. Because there is nothing good from devil. Let me tell you, church, listen. The best of devil will never be compared to even what God has for you. Because devil has nothing for you. Whatever he intends to give to you is just to suck you in. To destroy you. In verse 2 of Isaiah 31, yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back the, wo the words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who walk iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horse, horses and are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall, and he who is helped will fall down. They all will perish together. You see, here the Bible said, Egyptians are not God, they are human. Their horses are not spirit, they are flesh. They can help you no way. Running from one person to another person doesn't help you. Running from one prophet to another prophet to prophesy over you, to give you, to tell you what you want to hear, doesn't help you either. What matters is your relationship with God and not what you think that somebody can prophesy over you. 
Bible says we know in part and we prophesy in part. It is time we begin to come out from our miserable situation and begin to enjoy the love and the freedom and the liberty that God has for us. Man's method leads to a hopeless end, but God's way leads you to an endless hope. Turn to God. Do not put a question mark where God has set a period. Our problem in life is we always go contrary to God. We always want shortcut. We don't want to persevere. We don't want to be consistent in our relationship with God. We want to do things in order to get it as immediately. Because we live in a society of instant noodles. Instant emati. Bust instantly. Everything instant. Instant. So everybody wants things to be instant. In, in, also, we want to control God. Instant, you must come. God, the moment I say, God, you are there. God, you are there. I don't want to waste a second. That's the kind of life we're living today. Nobody now wastes upon the Lord, as the Bible says. Renew your strength no more. We cannot wait too long. I've been waiting and waiting. God wants us to allow his message to change us, not us changing his message. The problem with mankind today is we don't want the message to change us. We want to change his message. Therefore, if you are suffering from, listen carefully, if you are suffering from truth decay, you need to brush up yourself with your Bible. Now, many people are suffering from truth decay. We're not talking about truth decay. We're talking about truth decay. Many people don't want to listen to truth. They want what? Lies, manipulation. If you are suffering from truth decay, you need to brush up yourself with the Bible every day. So that your mind will be renewed, your life will be transformed. You will totally change. You will come out from your miserable position and become a person who embraces the love of God and move forward in the power of his mind. We are going to divide this topic into three. First, the characteristics of miserable people. Second, the characteristics of a lover of God. And thirdly, the way to freedom. How will you come out from your miserable position? God doesn't want you to be a miserable person. He wants you to be a lover of his. Because he has loved you with everlasting love. There are many Christians today, they are going through miserable time. Because they choose to be miserable. It's a matter of choice. Otherwise, you'll be happy in the Lord, serving him, loving him, knowing fully well that he did not intend for you to go through this miserable attitude. But he wants you to have joy and joy more abundantly. Let's look at the characteristics of the, a miserable person. First of all, we must understand, when we talk about being a miserable person, it means you are an unhappy person, gloomy, dejected, depressed, despondent, and sorrowful. No joy in your life. Even though you say you are married, when you were not unmarried, you say, if I'm married, I just want joy. Yet, you have never found joy since you are married. Some people say, I want joy. The moment I start serving the Lord, I will have the joy. Do you know many people has now changed, their calling has become like they are cut. Are you called or are you cut? You have to answer that question. Are you called or you are cut? You feel, ah, oh, I've been cut in a vicious circle. I cannot move. God wants us to enjoy his call. He wants us to enjoy serving him. He wants us to enjoy our family. Enjoy your children. Enjoy whatever he has blessed you with. You need to enjoy that. But many people are not. Enjoy your work. A miserable Christian always manifests the very characteristics that brought the devil down. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, from verse 13 through 14, you see how Satan, so miserable he was, wanted to overthrow God. He used the word I five times in that two verses. 
Isaiah 14, verse 13 through 14. We're not going to read that. At the time, you can read it. He used the word I, 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 I. That was what brought him down. A miserable Christian is full of himself or herself in everything. Devil was full of himself. A miserable Christian is always full of himself or herself. Like as if I am Alpha and Omega. I am every, I know what I am. What is your pride? I always ask that question. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and see what you look like? A person is never so empty as when he is full of himself or herself. What makes you to be proud? You are just a corpse that breathes. The difference between you and a, a corpse is just your breathing. That's all. So what makes you to feel that you are so great when you're supposed to humble yourself and surrender to God? As we sang that song, I surrender all. A miserable Christian is a backsliding Christian because if you are still alive in the Lord, you need not to be miserable. You're supposed to be happy. Regardless of what you go through, through persecution, you must be happy. Happy are ye when you are persecuted as a Christian. A Christian must not be miserable at all, at all, regardless of the situation you are going through. You must not show your gloomy face or show your unhappiness, show that you are sorrowful. Especially when we are hurt, we try to make it known, I am hurt. But you forget to know you also hurt people. I'm yet to meet somebody who comes to me and tell me, Pastor, I've hurt somebody. No, but I have met, many people I met is they hurt me. They hurt me. They hurt me. They never hurt anybody. They are the saints, others are the sinners. A miserable person thinks only about himself or herself, and that's what we call selfishness. Only think about himself or herself. Nobody else. A miserable person talks about himself or herself. That is self-centeredness. He uses the word I, me, my, and mine very often as possible as he or she can. I, me, my, and mine. That shows self-pity. A miserable person always sees himself or herself in the mirror of other people's opinion. Have you ever seen yourself at the opinion, at the mirror of others' opinion? That's how you see yourself. What they have to say about me, what they did to me, what they never done, what they're supposed to do. A miserable person blames others for their mistakes. When they make mistakes, they blame others. It's because of you that I made this mistake. They will never accept their wrong. Very defensive in everything. Very defensive. Especially when it comes to them. Very defensive. They are full of suspicion, jealousy, and envy. Miserable people. Very suspicious. Envious. Jealousy. When they see somebody talk to somebody, they begin to feel insecure. Envy. But they can talk, you know. They can talk to anybody, but when they see somebody talking to somebody else, they begin to suspect, full of suspicion. Cast out the demon out of you. Tell the Lord to set you free. No matter what you are, no matter the position you are holding, be it in five-four ministry or whatever you call yourself, or even if you are a minister, if you feel insecure and know that in your heart you are suspicious of people, you are operating in the spirit of envy and jealousy. Cut it out. Sometimes this is very common among women, this particular one. When their husband talks to somebody, they, they, they feel insecure. What makes you to feel insecure? When the Lord has blessed you, your husband is yours. You don't need to fight with anybody for that. What makes you to be envy, envious or jealous? What? Because you don't have a close relationship with God. You pray, but you never experience God himself. This one thing. Praying is one thing, but having experience with God 
You know, when I look at how Jacob had experience with God, Jacob was chosen by God. But sometimes, he, if, in short, not some, he did not recognize that, he did not realize that. The Bible told us in the book of Genesis, chapter 32, from verse 24 to 28, God has to literally confront Jacob. He fought throughout the night with an angelic being. Actually, God wanted to tell him, do you know you are a powerhouse? Don't behave as if you're insecure. Don't always say, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. God fought with him. The Bible told us. He had experience with God. Tell God, I want to have experience with you. Not just, oh, uh, Cockroach <laughs> Have experience with God. Have experience that makes you to be a real servant of God. That you don't feel insecure. You know that God has, has planted you. You are planted and built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ as a possible right to the church of Corinthians. No other foundation can man build except the foundation of Jesus Christ. Insecure. Fear, jealousy. Even though you say you pray, even though you read the Bible, take the Bible and read it every time, no experience. Probably it's because of what you inherited from your parents, either from your mother. Tell God, set me free, Lord. I'm your servant. I'm your child. I don't want to be insecure anymore. I don't want to feel jealous or also feel envious. Don't be suspicious of people. That's not the spirit of God. Sometimes people say, I'm, I have the discerning, I have the ability to discern. You don't discern, you are suspicious. Next. A miserable person expects to be appreciated, but never appreciate other people. They always want people to appreciate them. But they will never appreciate other people. They want you to acknowledge them wherever you see them. You want to say, hello, how are you? But they see you, they pretend. Or put their face down. Miserable attitude. They always re resent on others, especially when they feel not being acknowledged. They always easily resent on people. Do you resent on people? Look down on people? Because you feel inferiority complex. They trust nobody, but they want people to trust them. They want people to respect them. They want people also to consider them, but they don't trust anybody. Miserable people want everyone to agree to their selfish views. They want you to agree with them on their selfish views. Whatever they say, you must agree. If you say, no, I don't think that's the way, they get angry. They want you to agree with your perspective, which is not godly perspective. Beloved, seeing yourself at the center of a global attention will drive you to grave before it is time. Don't always look forward or uh, you, want people, you want to be a center of attraction, center of attention. Everybody must know, see you, recognize you. You will soon drive yourself to grave. It doesn't help. You are just one of billions of people in the world. You don't need to be center of attraction. Thank God for how he has made you. Bless his name. But don't always expect people to have to bow down to you. The real enemy of our Christian faith is four-letter word called self. You must know it. The real enemy of our faith is self. Self must be done away with. Self must die. God calls us to be selfless, not selfish. It must be done away with. Self. He must crucify self. Apostle Paul declared in the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The very life that I live today is the life that Jesus, the Son of God, gave to me. And it's that light that makes you to love the unloved, touch the untouched, and teach the untaught, reach the unreached. Have you ever asked God to make you to be an instrument to reach out to people? 
There are people who are looking for somebody to stand by them. Not necessarily your money, but with your love, your concern. We are only happy when people give us something. When they don't give us, we receive and we forget, but we don't forgive. I pray that we will never operate in miserable spirit anymore. God wants us to turn away. Turn your thoughts and your focus away from yourself. Begin to turn to God. You know why many people operate in miserable attitude? Turn with me in the book of Jeremiah chapter 48. Jeremiah 48 verse 11. Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. Therefore, his test remained in him, and his saint has not changed. You see it? People always show others miserable attitude because they have not been emptied from vessel to vessel. You have not been emptied. We need to be emptied. You have not gone through time of hardship or when you have never been to a situation whereby you are like an orphan. You don't have father. You don't have any parent. You don't have anyone to stand by you. You have been enjoying life because you see your parents. Not until something happens, you realize what it is. Have you ever put yourself at the shoes of those who are widows and know what they go through? The emptiness, the longing. Somebody who can stand by them and say, go ahead. You will receive counsel. Have you ever seen somebody who had been trained, or even, let me, let me share this with you. Have you ever met somebody who had been trained by the mother? No father figure. See how they behave. Then think about you being dead and your children go through that, that process. That's why it is, you have not been emptied from vessel to vessel. You do not know what it takes to go through hard time. Go through time when you just look up. It's you and God. That's all. You and God. I always share with people, if there's love in my life, it's not love because somebody gave it to me. It's love that God gave to me for people. I always share this with people. Because I lost my own father when I was hardly eight years old. And it is the love of God that came upon me that made me what I am today. I can show love to people. I know what it is. I've gone through that path. That's why that song, the Asap singer sang, it said, my brother, my sister, I know what you're going through because I've been there. Talk is cheap. <laughs> you've never been where? Do you know what it is to reach out to people and show them love, to advise them, this is the course you have to take in the polytechnic, this is the course you have to take in the university, this is the course you have to take in your master's degree, because this is how it's going to turn up in future, through godly wisdom, because you sought the Lord. It's not just because you talk. It's time we repent and say, God, may I not show any miserable attitude. Have you been emptied from vessel to vessel? Or you want the Lord to empty you? How can God fill you when you're still full? You have to be empty in order to be filled. We sing that song, break me, melt me, spirit of the living God, fall upon me. Break me, melt me, mold me and fill me. When God begins to break you, you say, oh Lord, too much. I cannot take it. I cannot take it. I cannot, you cannot take who take. You want me to take it? You don't want to take Let's look at the characteristics of a lover of God. A lover of God. Now you see the characteristics of a miserable person. I pray that you will not be miserable anymore. I pray that today you tell God, I've learned something. I'm not going to go back to my vomit. I'm not going to be a dog to go back to my vomit. But I'm going to be a lover of yours, O Lord. Turn the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your strength. See what the Bible said. You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's what it says. The lover of God is a selfless person and people-centered. When you love God, you become selfless and you become people-centered, not self-centered, people-centered. You always cry out to God to reach out to people, kneel before the presence of God and pray on behalf of others. A lover of God builds God's kingdom and not self-empire. You have no empire to build, but to be part of God's kingdom, to build it. Lover of God draws people to God and not to yourself. The problem we have today is we are building kingdom to have disciples. But instead of letting Jesus have the disciples, we have disciples for ourselves. We become gangs, operating like gangsters. There's no godliness. People cannot look at us and see Christ. What they see is we carry Bible, but our attitude is attitude of Satan. As I always say, on Sunday, we are like children of God. From Monday to Saturday, we speak like Satan and act like demons. Is that what God tells us? Let us be exemplary people in your words, in your actions, in your relationship with people. People can see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Lover of God gives freely for the cause of the gospel. You give freely. You don't need somebody even to tell you to give. You give freely for the cause of the gospel. And when you give, you don't expect people to come and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You don't need it. Because he that giveth unto the Lord will also receive of the Lord. When you give, give. It's for the glory of God. It is more blessed to give than to receive. He who receives also, let me tell you, are in more trouble. Because you give account of it to God. Lover of God always is always a leader with a servant heart. Are you a leader with a servant heart? You're willing to serve every moment. As I always share with you, a leader, who is the leader? You cannot lead until love comes. To lead, how does it come? Love will move you to service. Service will move you to do what? To lead others. And leading others means you have to wash others' feet. You cannot say you're a leader until you begin to wash others' feet. That's what Jesus said in John 13. You call me, Lord, yes, I am. But what you have seen me done, you must do the same. Any of you who wants to be a leader must be a servant, said Jesus. You must have a servant heart attitude. A lover of God does not have a superstar syndrome. This is a common thing, superstar syndrome. If you love the Lord, you won't have a superstar syndrome, which means self-seeking. Self-seeking. You don't need it. You don't need that. But you'll be a humble person. You are not ego-centered, but you possess servanthood attitude. Not always ego, ego, ego. You don't need it. But you possess servanthood. Anyone who meets you, who shakes your hand, who have conversation with you will know really that you are a son of God because you behave like Christ, not ego-centered. A lover of God gives God what is right and not what is left. Don't give God the leftovers. You give God what is right and not what is left. You must understand that don't give God a polluted offering. Give him the best. When we talk about the first fruit, we mean the best or the cream of the whole lot. The cream of the crops. Many people misunderstood that. Oh, he talked about first fruit because he's Jewish. That's not the issue. The issue is the first fruit means the best of all. That's what you give to the Lord. You give him the best. It's not the name it is called. But it is the signif- what is the significance of what we are collecting? The best of all to the Lord. A lover of God kneels before God in order to stand against all odds. If you love the Lord, you'll be a man or woman who kneels before him. I always say it. A man or woman who kneels before the throne of God 
We stand against all powers of darkness. You never be afraid. How much time do you spend praying? People misunderstand what prayer is. They think that prayer means you must go to a quiet place and just... You can pray anywhere you are. You must always have attitude of prayer. In every situation, are you happy? Are you not happy? You must always be under the influence of prayer. Even when you are answering phone, even when you are sending your SMS, it must carry the attitude of prayer that you can send a writing. Even when you are sending email out, I share what I experienced. When we send out, they come back and say, wow, pastor, you are right on the dot. Because you have attitude of prayer at that moment. Not because you just want to show up that you are pastor, but because you care. Jesus said, do you love me? Tend the sheep. He didn't say, do you love me? Kick the sheep. Or punch the sheep, or suck the sheep, or suck out their money. A lover of God, when he or she is wrinkled with burden, what does he do? He or she will run to God for a facelift. Are you all there? Sounds familiar, isn't it? So when you are wrinkled with burden, you need to run to God for facelift. You see, I got you there. Because you know, you know what you do. So now you begin to run to God for facelift. And he will really get those wrinkles out. I tell you, you know the iron of the Holy Ghost? When it, when it goes through those wrinkles of flesh, the, ooh, ooh, God says, yes, it's all getting straightened now. A lover of God uses prayer as a means of reporting to duty. Prayer becomes part of their life. They give themselves totally to prayer. You know, I get excited when I read the book of Acts chapter 6 verse 4, where the apostles said, let us give ourselves to prayer and the ministration of the word. And it didn't stop. The psalmist said in Psalm 109, in all that I've done, they have really shown me wickedness, but I give myself to prayer. Prayer becomes a means of you reporting to duty unto God. A lover of God always plans ahead for the rainy days. He does not wait until he is caught in the wave of poverty or uncertainty. Then he wakes up. He plans ahead. He plans ahead. Every time when I remember this, this ring to me, my conversation with one brother. Every time when I remember our planning, this ring in my heart. These brothers, I don't want to sit at home and look at the computers. I just want to do something. But I don't know, maybe that's my, according to me, say, maybe that is his weakness. I say, brother, that's not a weakness. The weakness is if you sit idle at home. That's a weakness. But thinking of what to do is not a weakness. You need to do something for your children. For your children's future. You cannot sit down because no matter what you have saved, when you begin to touch your savings, before you know it, you deplete it. But you need to make sure something comes in. So that is very important. A lover of God must learn how to plan ahead. You don't wait until you are sinking, then you say you need help. You don't need to wait until then. Now, how do we come out of miserable attitude? It's something very unique. The way to freedom. How do you come out of it? Let's go to the book of Psalms 125. Verses 1 through 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. See what the Bible said. How can we come out from our miserable attitude, which God never intended for us? We must come out through trusting God. Trust God for people. Where there is no trust, there will be no relationship. 
Relationship can come to existence because of trust. And that relationship cannot be strong unless there is commitment. And there will be no commitment in that relationship unless there is time investment. You must know that. So remember, what brings about relationship is trust. First, trust. If there's no trust, there's no relationship. You are just acquaintance. So what comes when trust has come? Relationship comes to existence. And how do we sustain that relationship? Through commitment. And how does that commitment come through time investment? Therefore, you must learn to operate in this way. If you want to be free from all miserable attitude, we must learn to trust God, fix our eyes on him. Let our thoughts, our actions, our deeds be in line with God's word. Many times you say, I heard, I heard. What you hear might not be from God. Now, how do we deal with this issue? For us to come out from a miserable attitude of being mean to people. First, don't be quick to take offense. Do not be quick to take offense. Otherwise, you will be under the control of those who offend you. If you are somebody who always you are quick to take offense, people who control you will always keep their tag on you because they always make you to be offended. Then you act. Secondly, you want to come out of miserable attitude? Don't let your life be defined by people's actions. Don't let your life be defined by people's actions. Because some people will just try to irritate you and you act. You say, you feel that? Do you know some people can even tell others? You watch her attitude. They send somebody to come and just provoke you. And you react. When you react, you say, they sell you with Judas kiss. Don't let your life be defined by people's action. Otherwise, you will lose your vision. You cannot see anymore. The little angels who sang for us here, amazing grace, say, I was blind, but now I can see. I pray that we can begin to see. Thirdly, do not find truth of any event to be bitter. Otherwise, you will be a slave to those who tells you what you want to hear. You know, many of us find truth to be bitter. We cannot accept truth. Uh, uh, it's a bit tough. Uh, I, I like to come to your church, but it's a bit, uh, I cannot take the message. It's a bit strong. Oh, you want us to give you sugary, sugary messages for you to suffer from spiritual diabetes. Then I end up praying for people. Maybe instead of living here by three, I live here by nine. Because people are suffering from spiritual diabetes. You don't need a convenient message. You need a convicting message. Convicting message. Not message that condemns you, but it convicts you to change. So don't find truth to be bitter. Otherwise, you will be a slave to those who tells you what you like to hear. And that doesn't save you. Fourthly, if you want to come out from your miserable attitude, do not be a touchy person, very touchy. Don't be easily angered. Don't be easily irritated. Otherwise, all your actions will be dictated by situation. Everything you want to do will be controlled by situation or circumstance. Don't be touchy. Don't be easily angered. Don't be easily irritated. There are many Christians, they are, they are like time bomb. Any time they will explode. Many Christians are like minefield in Cambodia. You step in, boom. You wouldn't know they are like that until you step in. Don't be a time bomb. You come to church, oh, very nice, oh, I surrender, or after that. Just after the service, somebody step on your toes, you explode. Ungodly anger destroys life. 
Next. Do not look for easy answers to problems of life. Otherwise, you will become a prey to empty promises. That's why you become miserable. Do not look for short or easy answers. Otherwise, you become a prey to empty promises. People will give you promises which they will never fulfill and you end up gathering your so-called promises for how many years? Nothing happens. Next. If you want to come out of your miserable attitude, do not be overwhelmed or preoccupied or dominated or hunted by what people think of you. Many people are literally living on what people say about them. After preaching, so what did they say? After worship leading, so how did they feel? Why do you want to bother? How they feel and what they say doesn't matter. Ask what God says. If you are hunted or dominated by what we have to say of you, you will be imprisoned by their opinion. You will be so totally imprisoned by the opinion, what they have to say about you, what they think about you. So you think, okay, if they say like that, which means I'm like that. Who told you that? Don't depend on the opinion of people, otherwise you'll be imprisoned by their words. Remember, I always say this. Works can break your heart, but it will never break your bones. Can I hear amen? Yeah. It will never break your bones. It can break your heart, but it will never break your bones. Beloved saints, we must have the courage to think for ourselves. Begin to think for yourselves according to the grace that God has given to you. We must possess the strength to accept what is necessary to stand on our feet. Always look forward to standing on your feet. Don't try to borrow feet from somebody else. Otherwise, when you need that feet, they will take it away from you. I always tell people, listen carefully. You know, bank as an institution, bank doesn't produce money. But they deal with money. Are you all there? Bank doesn't produce money. But they deal with money. They exchange money, exchange money with hands. But listen carefully. Bank will give you money or give you umbrella when it is not raining. When it is raining, they will take the umbrella. <laughs> Are you all there? So you must learn, as you go borrowing, 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 be careful. What am I trying to say? Don't go to borrow legs to stand. Stand on your own feet. When you need that borrowed feet, the owner will look at you because you borrowed the feet and you're going very nicely. You say, ah, it's my feet, you know. Hey, look here. Bring back. Bring back what? Your feet. But I want to go somewhere. I say I need it now. You're finished. So you must always remember that. Learn to stand on your feet. Don't depend on others. Otherwise, when you need, need the help most, you will not get it. We must have commitment and discipline to make a difference in all things for the glory of God. Discipline is very important. When I was called into ministry, I shared this a couple of times with you. There are four things God hammered into me. One, I must learn to be responsible to people who come to me and people I go to. Two, I must learn to be disciplined in every aspect of my life. Discipline. It does not mean that I answer your comments means I'm your slave. Be disciplined. There are time for God, there are time for man. Thirdly, I was told by God to be accountable to every saint that comes into the ministry and the one that I, I spend. Accountability. Fourthly is I must be responsible. Have I said that? Responsibility, discipline, accountability, and faithful. If I'm faithful and small thing, bigger thing be given. The question is, can people trust you? That's a question. You can look as an angel on the pulpit, but when they see outside, can they trust you? That's the question the world is asking the church today. Can we trust you for what you look, you seem to be? Or do we look for something else? 
We are definitely unique in Christ if we are willing to tell the Lord, here am I, Lord. I don't want to operate in miserable attitude anymore. Do you know the miserable attitude that you manifest makes people to feel uncomfortable with you? Even when you are saying the right thing, people don't seem to be listening because it's like he or she is a very mean person, very miserable. There's no point listening because you have made yourself that way. It is good for us as we hear God's word this morning. You tell God, it is my desire not to live a life whereby I portray miserable attitude towards people. Do you know that I always say, to me personally, just ordinary pain somebody can give to me, right in pain, it means a lot to me. I'm careful about it because I know that is somebody's sweat. But many of us, we just receive, we are like endless pit. Anything goes. Yet we don't show respect, we don't show concern to people. We make it as if it is their duty to give you what they give you or to do good to you. It's not. It's just God's grace. Have you ever talked about the attitude that you show towards people? How they feel? Can people count on you and say you are an example? Can people say, yes, looking at this man or this woman, I say, God, I thank you because there are still sincere people. Or when your name is mentioned, they cannot take it. You know, I ask myself this question. If Noah had a miserable attitude, are you telling me that God is going to say, did you see my son Noah? A righteous man? Absolutely no. If Job was a man of meanness or miserable attitude, you think that God can say what he said about him? A blameless man, a man who loved righteousness and shunned evil? No. It's time you begin to look. I always talk about self-examination. No need to always open the Bible and say, you know, the Bible said, no need. Self-examination. Begin to examine your life. This is the mirror that shows what you are. The way you talk, the way you behave. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Today, I'm talking lovingly with somebody. Tomorrow, I just do something to work the person and the relationship just get broken. The relationship become breakdown relationship. I always say, if I know I cannot face you, if I do evil to you, I better don't do that evil. Because when I see you, I won't have the face to look at you. But I would like to have a face where when I meet you, I embrace you, I reach out to you because I know I have nothing against you. My heart is clean. But if you have something in your heart, well, I leave you with God. God's people, God has been speaking since January 1 till today. Teaching us because God wants to draw us closer and closer to himself. He wants us to be closer to him. He wants us to live yesterday's event and begin to come closer. Take a step closer to the Lord. Take a step across the line and say, Lord, my desire is to follow you. Come with me. Dying to self is nothing but obeying God at all costs. That's what it is. That's what Apostle Paul said. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Dying to self is obeying God at all costs. No suspicion, no jealousy, no envy. Love flows. Let love cover as multitude of sin. Don't make people to stumble. Making people to stumble does not mean you have to commit sin. Your words can make people to stumble. Your actions can make people to stumble. Therefore, God wants you to take off all those impediments. Just as he spoke in the book of Isaiah chapter 62 verse 10. So make a highway. Make way for the people. Don't be a stumbling block. May the Lord help us that we will be people who have a good character, good attitude. In any way we are serving, not being a stumbling block to people or being Christians with miserable attitude. I pray that we become lovers of God and not people with miserable attitude. When you hear the voice of God, do not harden your hearts. Let's stand on our feet. <laughs>